It's Christmas break in 1982, and the CBC is airing four new episodes of The Kids at Grassy Street. Degrassi's now in the transition from yearly educational short films to an actual television series. And we're going to go through it, because a lot is about to change in the history of Degrassi. How do I look? Terrific. The first story is Lisa Makes the Headlines, and the episode follows Lisa and Casey as they start a newspaper called the Degrassi Street Journal. Lisa decides they need a big story if they want to increase newspaper sales, but when a miscommunication happens about some borrowed books, Lisa prints that Ida Lucas was robbed. Why didn't you tell us you were robbed, Ida? Well, it wasn't such a big deal. No big deal? All your books and stuff? If it was me, I'd call in the RCMP. Is that what it says? All my books? Let me see. The RCMP doesn't investigate crimes like this, stupid. be a miracle the day Lisa comes up with the facts. You can tell with this episode that Degrassi's gotten more creative in their storytelling. The scripts have more plot points, they're moving around the Degrassi Street area more, and there's even more kids involved with the story. And this episode is told by Lisa's voice, narrating us through her misguided journalism. Every day there's lots of news. There's good news, bad news, happy news, and sad news. But no matter what the news is, people always want to read all about it. That's why I want it to be a journalist. And you may find that Casey seems familiar. Well, she'll stay with the show until Degrassi Junior High, where she goes by Susie, and she's played by Sarah Charlesworth. For a fun behind-the-scenes fact, both her real-life mother and her real-life brother appear as characters in the show. We'll also see Lisa and Noel's father come back. He'll be in a few more episodes with us through the rest of the series. But this is, however, the last time we'll see Alan Misu playing Fred Lucas in the franchise, which is unfortunate because I really liked Fred. I'm not going to get stuck with all your chores again, Ida, so watch it. But now there's three things that happen in this episode that I really want to point out. First, we get a sense of the early 80s through and through with this huge printing press. Look at the size of these things and the little tiny children <laughs> trying to use it. And second, we get some throwbacks to the original films. We see Irene has joined the club and she stayed friends with Ida. And there's a nod to Ida makes a movie when Noel buys a birthday present with property of Ida T. Lucas on it. And I absolutely love that. I like want that for my collection. <laughs> and third, we'll see this journalism storyline again and again with Stacy's characters. Lisa plays around as a reporter through Degrassi Junior High and Degrassi High. Caitlin writes for the student newspaper. And we'll see Caitlin come back in the next generation as a famous environmental reporter up until her last appearance in 2008. What also is interesting is that Emma goes on to play Caitlin's parallel in Degrassi The Next Generation. And Emma famously goes through similar storylines of prying into people's personal lives for the sake of integrity and honesty and responsibility, only to realize she got all of her facts wrong and actually made everything worse. <laughs> And we'll see similar parallels happen in Claire Edwards' storylines down the line. And it's just so interesting to think that this moment in 1982 held so much influence over the future of Degrassi. I love that. Now, the second episode is Sophie Minds the Store, and it came out only one week later this time. This is the only time we'll meet Sophie, but she makes a pretty big impact. Her family owns the Degrassi Street grocery store, and Sophie is left in charge to run it. Now, the ethics of leaving an 11-year-old kid alone and to run a business is, is beyond me, but anyway, the story is that Sophie's watching the store, and Chuck offers to help. Sophie has to leave the grocery store for a little bit to do a delivery, and Chuck stays behind. But at the end of the night, Sophie realizes that $20 is missing. Now, Sophie blames Chuck because he said he needed $20 to buy his dad a Christmas present, and his dad just so happens to be in jail. So Sophie accuses him of stealing it. But it turns out that she just made a mistake. Now, I really value Chuck's character. Like, his dad is in prison, and he's just very emotionally adjusted about it. Like, it comes up a few more times in the series, and he just, like, recognizes that it's not embarrassing, and there's nothing he can do about it. Like, listen to this. Are they going to give him that day pass at Christmas? They might. Otherwise, we'll just have to go there. That must be weird. That jail's not so bad. His room is small, but it's okay. Well, I better go. See you. I love that. And later, we'll also see Noel be very mature and responsible when he holds Chuck accountable. Because there's a moment in the episode when Sophie confronts Chuck and brings up his dad. And Chuck gets very upset, so he pushes Sophie into a bread display. And this is what Noel has to say when Chuck tells him the story. Anyway, your dad didn't push Sophie, you did. 
just, every time a kid makes a really good decision in the show, I'm just like so proud of them for it. Like, good for you, Noel. But that's basically it for storytelling. The main reason this episode stands out is because of the amount of cameos and special guests we have in it. Bruce Mackey, who plays customer with dogs, and you'll remember he's the one who like truly lives on Degrassi Street and he helped Linda make her first film. And of course, Linda makes an appearance as customer with hat. So of course, we have to pause and take a moment. Just watch the icon herself act in her own TV show. Uh, do you think you can change a 20? No problem. I can do this. It's okay. Okay. Thank you. Oh. Oh, thank you, young man. You're welcome. Um, great job, Linda. We love it. And that's the bulk of Sophie Minds the Store. There's not a lot of big changes this time around because every other film, one full year was passing and now it's all made at the same time. But an important moment does happen with Casey Draws the Line, which is our next story. Yan Moore, who we saw with the film editing credit in Noel Buys a Suit, now has his first Degrassi writing credit. And this is because Yan stepped up and was able to fix a plot hole problem that was going on with the episode. And again, a small moment that went on to change the course of Degrassi history forever. That's amazing. And speaking of writers, we get our first on-screen appearance, finally, of Wendy Watson, who plays Miss Gonzalez. And you'll remember, she's the one who wrote the theme music with her husband. And it's also cool that Lisa and Noel's new mom finally comes back to make an appearance. Well, we just got our tax assessments, and, um... Well, you see this property line that divides yeah. the Rothfells' backyard from ours? It's off by about two feet. Really? And as great as that was, that's basically it. <laughs> the storytelling is more advanced this time. It used to just be like, Ida wants to make a movie. Oh, Ida's camera is broken. Well, Ida gets her camera fixed. But now there's more characters. They interweave into each other's stories. Their dialogue is less direct, which means characters can misunderstand each other and get into more hijinks. But it just means that a lot goes on that doesn't really need to be summarized. But for Casey Draws the Line, the idea is this. Lisa and Casey are arguing over this pet bunny. Things go wrong, and they realize they shouldn't be fighting, and they make up. But because of their fight, the bunny dies and gets put into a garbage bag. Like, <laughs> excuse me, Degrassi, there is authentic storytelling, and then there is authentic trauma. Like, oh my god, I could not believe that. We move on from that moment to Pete takes a chance. And again, long story short here, Pete tries all these different ways to make money. He enters contests, he buys raffle tickets, and he even starts to sell these, like, joke toys to his classmates. But then he gets into some trouble when he sells a toy that doesn't work, and he goes on to learn from his mistake. Now, the story isn't really all that amazing, but there is, again, some notable people that we meet. For example, you might recognize that Pete is actually Alex from Degrassi Junior High, and he's going to stay on with the show until Degrassi High. We also mean Tyson Talbot, who plays Billy in the series, and he's later going to appear one more time as Jason in Degrassi Junior High. We also learn that Pete is Chuck's brother, so they both share the same father who's in jail. Now, Nancy Sinclair plays Martin Sheagle's mom in the series, but we'll remember her as Derek Wheeler's mom in Degrassi Junior High, and whose character notably passes away in a car accident. And now finally, here's another fabulous appearance from Mr. Bruce Mackey himself. <laughs> <coughs> Martin, is that yours? Out. And take that with you. I love every single time Bruce pops up in the show, I gotta say. <laughs> but there we have it. Playing With Time has now put out eight stories for the kids of Degrassi Street. And next time, CBC is going to go on to order a dozen episodes from Linda and Kit, cementing the kids of Degrassi Street as an actual series. Woohoo! Finally! But for now, let's remember these very basic things. Don't leave an 11 year old and charge your business. Don't put your kid's dead pet in a garbage bag right in front of them. And most importantly, come back next week when I talk a little bit more about the history of Degrassi. Mm -hmm.